It's a nice group. Good, there's four, lots of things going on in the chat. We appreciate that. Okay, so I would say we're a few minutes after. I think we should begin, but I'm gonna check with my buddy, Rika. What do you think, Rika? Should we start or you wanna wait a minute? What's your sense? Um, I think we can go ahead. We already have okay. more than 70 people on the call, so that's okay, a good, good. start. So let's go then. Next slide, please. Thank you to everybody who's joining in. We're just getting ready to, to call here in a moment. And thanks for your patience. Also in the chat, you can see where to uh, put in the uh, go to the poll because we're doing a poll on the chat. Okay, I'm Robert Burnside. I'm your facilitator today. That's a picture of me about 10 years ago. <laughs> I thought I might have to do that one. And we have Laos Loritsen with us. Laos is going to help us figure out how to keep our brains active and positive during this uh, crisis we're in. And Rika is going to tell us how to keep our bodies healthy. So this is going to be good. We're going to have a really nice time here. But honestly, uh, people, the reason we're doing this, we want to hear from you, honestly. We consider you the Shakers community. We're facilitators, we're stimulators or thought provokers as we say here, but really we need you, we need you. We need your thoughts, we need your feelings, we need your actions to build this uh, community. Uh, so thank you so much for, for being here. Okay, Rika, next slide, please. So, People, feel free to turn on your webcam. It's best if we can see each other, but it's okay to leave it off too. That's up to you. I know some of, some of you are just on phones. Uh, please mute yourself when you're not speaking. So we have, uh, you know, just to reduce the background noise, you know how that is. Uh, very important, please pay attention here. The session is being recorded, okay? We are recording this session and we are going to share it publicly afterwards. So please keep that in mind. And it's okay with us if you want to go off the webcam, you don't want to be recorded on the webcam, that's up to you. Also what you say, what you post in the chat is up to you, but please be sure, be clear. We are recording this and we will share it afterwards. Okay, our focus today, how are organizations responding to the coronavirus? How are, how are we dealing with it now? I'm here to tell you, nobody's prepared, it's pretty clear but let's talk about what people are doing. And even more important, how do we prepare a future workplace, you know, where we can deal with such things. We wanna shake up the workplace, we wanna prepare the future so that we can deal with crises like this. Uh, as Laos was saying earlier, there's a lot of these coming along the way, might as well get ready for, for them. Okay, uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> This is our agenda today, and we're going to be very clear. We'll, we'll go just uh, until 10 o'clock, and then we'll stop. Uh, our, we're going to shake it up. We're going to move in a little bit. We're going to hear the results of our poll from Ola. Laos is going to take us through the healthy brains in a crisis. That's, that's really interesting information there on how we approach things like crises. <clears throat> Uh, Rika's going to take us through dimensions of well-being, <clears throat> and then we're going to use most of our time, we'll see, uh, probably 20, 30 minutes to get everybody to talk about what are you doing? What do you think we should do to build the future? And uh, then we'll close with the idea we want to stay connected for this community to build itself until we get together face to face, probably in September. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> Okay, over to who? So first, uh, uh, hi, my name is Reka. And before we do the exercise uh, with the Shake It Up, we would like to share the first poll results that you were uh, doing uh, while you were waiting. So just give me a second to share that uh, screen with you. And... Uh, uh -oh. So, 
Ja. Oh oh. So, this is the, can you see uh, the Mentimeter screen, everyone? Yes, yes, we see it, I see it. All right. So it's updating now, and we had two questions. Uh, Ola, would you like yes, to share them? Absolutely. And in the meantime, while we are sharing the results, uh, you still can go to menti.com on your phone, submit the code and give us some more answers. Um, and we see the, the zipper is still moving. So there were two questions we were asking to, as we were checking into this meeting. How are you feeling about the current situation the COVID-19 has created? We have 2.9, so it's somewhat concerned. Um, and interestingly, the second question was around the organization feeling. So how is the organization feeling about the current situation? And we can see a slight um, higher score. So we are closer to a bigger concern in the organization. Very interesting to, to see that. And hopefully during the call, we will be able to address, you know, how you personally can deal with the situation and the concern and also We'll have hopefully some, some tips you can take away for yourself uh, and for your organization. Thank you, Ola, for sharing. Um, and we go back uh, to our uh, slides. And uh, yeah, we will do some more polling uh, during this um, uh, time together. Um, so uh, I would like to ask uh, or invite you to stand up or stay seated and uh, to you know really shake it up uh, in our bodies um, please take a power pose <laughs> that empowers you to face a crisis like a virus or a big challenge in your life so we will do the same here in our room uh, and uh, yeah it would be really cool if uh, if you could do it uh, in front of your camera <laughs> So I give you five seconds, be spontaneous, uh, yeah, coming yours, so one, two, three, four, five. <laughs> yeah. I would like to see more of you, so please stay there. I can see a lot of interesting power poses yeah. in front of the screen, yes, beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> well done, everyone. <laughs> and uh, yeah, this was, uh, you know, it can be very different for everyone. Uh, like in uh, the screen, you see one version of it. Maybe this was yours. Uh, so we will also learn uh, later some. Uh, Facts: how the brain uh, and the, the body connects and how you know you can influence your thinking even through a power pose and, and uh, then through your body. So Ola, mm -hmm. it's uh, your turn again. So if you flip on the, again on your computer, there is exactly the same code. Now we'll have a different question. Can you flip here? Mm -hmm. So now we are asking actually everybody to share one word. Oh, go back. No. Yes. So now we would like to hear from all of you. What is one word that comes to your mind when you think about uh, the well-being in a crisis? And I can already see some of the, the words are coming in. Overreaction, surviving, uncertainty, calm is the biggest one, resilience focus, beautiful, holistic health, overreaction, <laughs> stress, positive mindset, beautiful. Those are great, those are great. Calm, it's right in the middle, calm. Hmm. Mm -hmm. hmm. I'll survive. <laughs> yeah. 
we can see the size of the words if people typed it the most, then the, this is the biggest word for us. So hopefully, yes, we are keeping calm. And resilience is probably the second biggest word, uncertainty, focus, some really good words, but also informed clarity, solidarity. I like that. Surviving. I want to, if I may <laughs> want to say hello to Bruno, thank you for showing your screen to your partner there. Hello, partner. <laughs> and we have some more people still coming in so just welcome to everybody who is coming in we are currently doing a mentimeter exercise around sharing one more word that comes to your mind when you think about the well-being in crisis and we have some beautiful reactions here calm resilience uncertainty focus being the the most popular ones I like the fact, somebody says fact check. I like that too. <laughs> we have 57 responses on Mentimeter and we have 85 participants at the moment. So I'll just give two more minutes for everybody to respond. Okay, I see the chat is quite active. So if anybody's not seeing the chat, you can always Go on the chat, make a comment, ask a question. Lots of good things going on in the chat. Okay, I think we should probably start to move on if you're okay with that, uh, Rika. Yes, uh, absolutely. So let's uh, go back. And uh, now I uh, give the stage for uh, our uh, thought provoker of the day, Laus Lauritsen, uh, who is dialing in uh, directly from uh, Denmark, Copenhagen. And he, yeah, he would have been here with us today in person. And uh, yeah, we are very happy to welcome him online. Hi, Laus. Hi, hi. Yes, I would certainly, I would have preferred to be down there with you. I will look forward to this on conference, but uh, I guess this must be the second best solution you chose. Uh, hi, my name is Laust, uh, and I have 10 minutes to, to share with you some very important stuff. So, so let's just get started. Maybe I should start by referring to the vote we just had, because there was one word there I was missing. Uh, a word that I mean is so important, actually, whenever it comes to face a crisis, and this word is energy. I will come back to you and I'll tell you about what I mean by that. So um, my um, 10 minutes here will be focused on the mindful and uh, brain-friendly approach to crisis. That's a broad, that's a broad topic and, and I know we cannot really go deep into it. So I will narrow it a bit down and let's see if I have a control on my own slides now, if, if this is, is so. Uh, no, otherwise I will ask you. Uh, yeah, you should to have it. Next slide. I can have you, you could not really give me the power. Huh? <laughs> 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 Let me try the next slide then. Yes. Here we have the, the new one in, in our mind. Uh, this is uh, the severe uh, acute respiratory syndrome virus. You have seen it before, haven't you? Yes. Uh, and it's, 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 it's all natural. I mean, this, this comes from time to time. And normally uh, viruses, they, uh, they stick to one species, but from time to time they jump to another species, as we saw here now from, from bats or snakes to, to humans. And then we have the trouble because we don't have any defense against it. We have met it before, so, so we are really vulnerable, uh, not only as, as, uh, as persons, but also as a society. So, so, so Basically, it's, it's okay, uh, seen from a biological uh, perspective, it, it will just, it's, it's an arrangement that keeps uh, the populations, the species uh, healthy and, and, and strong. But we, as human beings, we don't like it. Uh, can I have a next slide, please? We don't like it because uh, immediately it touches on some buttons. One of them is, is, is the, the, the loss aversion, uh, the, the fear of death, actually. Uh, and, and then it also comes in, into the, the, the big problems about uh, the capacity of our healthcare systems and, and the protection of our businesses and workplaces. So, so it all comes together. And uh, this, uh, please take the next slide. 
this is not brain friendly. Not at all, because what the brain actually wants uh, is to, to have things go very easy, fun and rewarding. Uh, and it, it all boils down to, to energy. Uh, the brain, uh, during the, the times of evolution, kind of developed this craving for a lot of energy. Maybe up to 20, 25% of all the energy intake we have during a day will actually go to the brain. So it's, it's a costly organ. So it needs to find way, ways to save energy and not waste it. So it tries to do anything, put anything into to, to some kind of uh, habitual patterns and, and comfort zones and all that stuff. Uh, and, and when it comes to a crisis where we cannot put, uh, predict things, where we cannot control things, immediately we move into some kind of, of survival mode where we, where we try to protect ourselves and, uh, and our families and, and, and communities and so on. Please take the next slide. So if we want things to move from uh, the, the red side to the green side, uh, from the hard, uh, scary, uh, challenging uh, <clears throat> uh, situation. And uh, you can think about it a, bit, a little bit like, like uh, pulling a, or moving a slider or a lever to, to the left here. So if we can do something little that makes uh, this situation easier, more fun and rewarding, that will help a lot. Uh, and for, for reasons I will, I will tell you about in a moment. But before we can do that, before we can move into the brain-friendly uh, approach, we need to, to become mindful. Please, next slide. Uh, and a mindful response is the opposite of an emotional reaction. An emotional reaction is where we, we try to, to, to escape, we try to, to find ways to survive or, or fight things. We, we become emotional, really uh, uh, <clears throat> aggregated and so on. So, so the opposite of that is, is a, a mindful response. And, and that is where you kind of keep your ground. Uh, and, and, and as I said here, you, 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 you breathe. You just take some deep breath and immediately when you start doing that, and I guess you could do it right now, just take a deep breath and maybe one more and, and make sure you come all down to your belly. And what happens is that you will get more oxygen into your blood and, and, and you will have a switch from the sympathetic to the parasympathetic uh, nervous system and you will start to shunt some blood to the, the, the frontal part of your brain, which means that you will be able to make more informed uh, choices and take better actions. It's like you are you're expanding your scope of mind from, from being habitual, personal, tribal, what I normally call the ego mindset, and then when you start to open and expand your scope of mind, you move into a more global and, and, and universal mindset, the geo mindset, I call it. That means that now we can also start to make choices where you include the, the situation of not only of yourself and your family, but also the, the community, the, the society and so on. So that, this is a good start to actually take some deep breath before you start uh, figuring out what to do. Next slide, please. So now I, I will have, uh, you could say, I have elaborated a little bit about this easy, fun and rewarding and see how, how does that really relate to a crisis situation. And, and the, <clears throat> the easy part for me, uh, it all comes down to adapt fast. And that means don't fight against the circumstances. As you did, for instance, uh, the organizers around this uh, on conference, they, they sat down and, and they looked at it and emotionally it's quite hard to make these kind of decisions or choices uh, to, to postpone or cancel a, an event like this because you have put so many uh, hours of work and emotions into it and we have all looked forward to it. But this is part of it actually to, to kind of embrace the situation and, and then make uh, sound uh, choices out of that. Uh, and then save energy for more important issues, which will be in this situation to take care of yourself, your family and, and business and so on with, with, with good choices. So adapt fast, uh, spend your energy wisely. Uh, next slide, please. When it comes to the fun part, it is not fun to talk about biases and, and think about what they can do to us, but staying positive, we know from a lot of research in many areas, it will strengthen your immune system. Uh, 
And that's important here because that is maybe the most important thing uh, because a virus like this, a, a new stranger to our system, really can challenge your immune system if it is occupied with other things. That is also why these uh, older uh, uh, citizens and, and, and people with, with uh, some kind of illnesses and so on, uh, reflecting the, uh, or, or involving the immune system, then will be busy with other things and then this virus knocks on the door and maybe you cannot actually fight against it. So it's important to stay positive and, and, and uh, imagine the light for, uh, in the end of, uh, by the end of the tunnel. Next slide, please. And finally, this about the rewarding um, thing. In, in a situation like this, where, where the crisis is, is close to uh, our lives, it's important to kind of have this anticipated happy ending theory, which is linked to stay positive. That is that you actually, we are able to, to uh, visualize and think about uh, the good stuff that will come out of this. And a lot of good stuff will come out of this. I will, I will into that. Uh, and then it's kind of, of, of telling your brain uh, that is going to, it is going now to look for some proof of progress or belief and it will find it. So it will find small, uh, small data and information around, for instance, not focusing so much about the death toll, how many people actually did not make it, but more focus about how many people made it, how many came out on the other end and how fresh and immune uh, towards this, uh, this uh, disease. So it's important to to be grateful for, for all good things happening. That will again also uh, send a message to your brain and your hormonal system that is, this is actually going in the right direction. Uh, next slide, please. So when it comes to the, the very fast uh, crash course into what the, the brain-friendly and mindful approach to crisis is, I will, I will sum it up as, um, yeah, you, you respond mindfully, take your time, expand, uh, leave room for your, your thoughts to arrive and make good choices. Then you adapt fast, you stay positive and uh, make sure to be grateful for any progress. Uh, and then uh, remember that, that all crises, they actually represent two things. They represent danger, but they also uh, represent opportunities. New opportunities will arrive. For instance, just consider how it is going with the climate, climate change right now, challenge right now. Something good is happening here. You, just this one thing that in the Asia, they start to discover that working from home is quite all right. And that will, that will, that will mean that trend costs will go down and a lot of good things will happen uh, after, in the aftermath after this crisis. That was my uh, contribution, uh, and I guess maybe the, Rob, there are some uh, questions or, or comments. Yeah, we hope, we hope to have uh, questions or comments from our group. As the facilitator, um, I would welcome anyone who's on mute but would w wish to ask Laos a question or make a comment, please unmute yourself and speak, okay? And if we're all silent, I will call on people. That's part of my role as a facilitator. <laughs> so uh, I'm gonna call on Philippa. Philippa, would you please respond so that uh, we can show that uh, we're paying attention? <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, thank you very much. I think it's a very nice refresher of, of how important it is to be mindful. And I think many of us on this call probably have that positive mindset and so it resonates very deeply what you say. What I find in, in my work is that I attract lots of people who are like-minded like we are and so those kind of messages resonate very well but there's always a small percentage of people so in client organizations you can say that and it resonates with a few people and the rest are saying well be positive there's something to be positive about and death and you know it's all very well to say that. I don't know if you have it you brought you why I expect you to have a magic answer, I don't know, but it'd be nice if you did. Any kind of suggestions for how to reach those people who are not as open-spirited and open-minded as, as they need to be to be able to take on board that advice? Great question. Yeah, very, very good question. That is why it's so good to have a practice before the crisis appears, huh? uh, that you have already practiced that you can uh, 
be mindful and maybe also that you can uh, connect to other people and have this conversation around what is going on. And that is maybe the most important thing to, to start with. That is actually to allow conversations to happen around what is going on. And for me, it is about two things that you have the facts which are outside, something that the news are sharing all the time, good and bad. And then there is personal truth. And these are two different things. The experience on what is happening in, is so different from what is actually happening out there. So allowing people to have conversations around it and asking positive questions. That means if you have people in a, a, during a lunch time and they start to, to talk about all these dead people in Italy or they start to talk about this and that, then you just calmly ask some positive questions into to this conversation try to maybe lift their, their view a little bit from the, 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 the personal tribal uh, level to the global level and, and, and talk a little about what I, for instance, do about this uh, climate and the pollution and so on. And, and that this is actually sometimes one way in that you start to talk about there's also some good about it. Yeah, Laos, that's, that's really uh, helpful. I, I appreciate the question from Philippa and also a, a very clear answer. We have a question in the chat from Jane Piper. How can you help people who have moved into a mode of scarce scarcity, hoarding food and masks? How can you help them? Yeah. About any answers? Yeah. First answer is you cannot really help help them. That is why you make these rules about it. You can just see what happened in, in, in Italy. Now that they, they, they kind of isolated a part of the, the, the country, immediately people they try to escape. And they don't think about this actually, I'm bringing this disease with me to the South. It, it is crazy. And you cannot actually, when people have moved into this situation, I know it because I used to work with psychiatry, you cannot do nothing but kind of protect them against themselves. Uh, and then wait to, 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 to more calm periods where you can have a talk with them. So that's, that's how it is. You, you cannot actually uh, convince people that are starting to, to, to take stuff into their uh, kitchen and so on. You cannot. They, it's over. Yeah, that makes sense to me, Laos, too, because I'm here in Italy. And of course, uh, Saturday night, well, we're, we're Monday. So Saturday night, about 10 o'clock, Italy announced we're going to shut down the north. That was very panicking, even for me because I had to run and drive back to my house because I wouldn't be allowed to drive anywhere. When I went to the grocery store yesterday here in this uh, town I'm in, uh, people were quite panicked. And I agree with you, uh, Laos, that when one is panicked, there's not much you can do because everything is shut down and it's almost in a fight or flight, you know. Uh, it, it, it's uh, the um, dinosaur brain, I guess you would say. Okay, I think we have time for one more uh, comment. If someone wishes to speak, you can unmute. And I'm going to call on someone if we don't hear anything. I'm going to call on Katrin Grunwald. Katrin, hello. Could you unmute yourself and make yeah. a comment or anything? Yeah. I was wondering, um, Laos, is there a certain kind of mantra or a like affirmation to to in mindfulness exercise to include this uh, such as I'm healthy, all my cells are doing well, or something of that sort that you maybe personally include also in your mindfulness exercises? Yes, uh, you, I bet the best ones are the one that you come up with yourself, but you can actually just, just what you ask for now, you could just write into Google and you will find a lot, many lists there, uh, some of them cool. I guess the most important thing uh, when it comes to, to mantras and, and, and affirmations, so that is actually the, to know that it is a combination of two, two things. One thing is the clear thought, the clear image, the clear uh, message. I want this, I believe in this, and so on. The other thing is actually that you strongly feel positive around it. So that, that's a different part. So that is why you have to kind of sit down and repeat it again and again and, and kind of build up this positive uh, emotion in your body. And when they combine the clear thought and this elevated emotion, then it will kind of protect in a way we cannot really explain why. There are a lot of explanations for it, but you need to combine it. But just sitting there and, and repeating the affirmation, that will not help you. You need to go deeper. And, and I know Rekha will, will confirm that later, maybe. Cool, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And thank you, Katrin, for letting me uh, surprise you with calling on you. So <laughs> uh, I would like to go back to Rika. Rika, I think we should uh, move, move on. Yes, uh, I am also ready to do so. Um, 
So let me just uh, go further with the slides. And I am mindful of the time. <clears throat> I really would like to leave enough uh, time for, for everyone, you know, to, to uh, have a dialogue because it already started. Uh, so I will try to keep it uh, short. And Robert, please also remind me on this time. Uh, you are the timekeeper and the facilitator. So whatever, yeah, you, you see that uh, I have uh, only like two minutes left and uh, I am happy to, to be reminded. So um, I would like to build on what Laos uh, shared with us and you will find maybe like some overlaps and similarities. It's just uh, another approach. Uh, you are all uh, familiar with the pyramid of Maslow, the famous pyramid. Um, and uh, Laust mentioned the, the, the word that was missing in the poll, energy. So I am happy that I put this already before on this slide, what gives us energy at work? If we just uh, look at this uh, pyramid, uh, at the bottom, there are the very physical needs uh, that uh, usually in our society nowadays in the Western world, you know, they are like a tick, uh, tick mark, check mark. Uh, we have a salary benefits, health and, and, and well-being. So we uh, are usually not uh, in a situation of such a, a virus or epidemic. Then uh, if we go a bit uh, further in the pyramid, then we have the safety love and belonging, which are more about uh, uh, less uh, uh, physical, but more emotional needs, then accomplishment and esteem, self-actualization, and this we then go into very uh, abstract subjects like mission and your purpose in life, personal growth. And nowadays, when we, we talk about uh, uh, well-being in organizations, then we very often uh, you know, stay on the top of this pyramid because basically um, all, all other things are there. Of course, yeah, we, we have to move and, and then go to the gym and, and do yoga, but, you know, um, such a situation that uh, your, your life is threatened by a virus is, is not there. So this is now a, a new perspective that uh, we have to go back uh, to the bottom of this pyramid and uh, reevaluate what is important in, in life. Um, I also have another slide for you, uh, which uh, goes more into the organizational side of, um, um, of, of the well-being and health, because uh, then uh, business performance is uh, very much driven by the uh, vitality of employees, which is then based on a very human uh, needs, very basic human needs. And uh, when we talk about uh, performance management, which is there, you know, like how some people, they get their salary really based on strict per uh, performance management measurements. Um, then, uh, yeah, we assume that everything else is already there, the well-being, fitness, health. Um, but in this uh, uh, case, uh, right now, we again have to go uh, deeper uh, back in this uh, diagram and then see, okay, what are the medical benefits uh, that will uh, come uh, and gain more importance uh, in a virus situation? Uh, how uh, can we then assist our employees to really uh, uh, have this grounding? And then uh, we can add more about the, the fitness, uh, the mental well-being, and, and then we can go back again and talk about the sustainable performance at work. So the, um, a bit of uh, what Laos uh, already mentioned uh, uh, in a different perspective, you know, uh, when you think about uh, the news uh, that you consume, and uh, I always say that some of them, you know, make you aware, it is an awareness communication, but uh, as you create your own reality, for some people it lands as a, as a panic communication. And it really happens in this process of, uh, of your decision making, how you um, um, then uh, digest these news. So when, uh, when you are in a crisis, the first uh, stage is the stalling. Then you, you stop and uh, basically what you usually do is you, you would like to keep in your comfort zone and uh, not get out of it. And, uh, and then uh, you stop, you start thinking, and then you decide what to do. And this is where you can tap into your uh, own uh, uh, 
uh, abilities and decide, okay, so am I gonna panic or am I just gonna you know, be aware of what's going on? And um, that's when all these mindfulness exercises uh, come uh, into practice. And it's good that you already practice this before a crisis comes. Uh, like uh, if you think about just the uh, firefighters, you know, if they really have to decide every time on what's going on there and, and react uh, uh, in, in the moment, uh, then you, you are already lost. So then you start thinking about how to handle it. But if you, if you have a habit and you react uh, based on your habits, uh, then uh, you can recall all these good techniques that you have already in your pocket and then at the end just uh, do it yeah that's uh, that sounds like the nike thing just do it <laughs> <laughs> thank you yeah. so we're about we sh should probably move on if you have one last thing to say we should probably move mm -hmm. on to our conversation mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks uh, for the reminder. So uh, I have some uh, uh, techniques for individuals, uh, you know, the, uh, going through this pyramid, uh, the, the physical um, techniques, how you boost your immune system, you really, you know, keep uh, all these uh, sanitizers and around you and use them. Uh, in the emotional uh, level, you uh, can uh, uh, create new habits or just, you know, stick to your old habits because this, uh, you might stay at home from work. So it's a very different environment, but whatever you have as a basic, if you stick to that, that gives you more comfort in, in life. And you can also enjoy other uh, communication channels with your colleagues and keep that uh, uh, psychological safety. Then uh, on the mental level, already mentioned uh, by Laust as well, the deep, uh, take a deep breath before you react and spiritually uh, be grateful, you know, what, uh, uh, what is there already. And uh, uh, if we then uh, go to the organizational part, how, and this is what very, I would like to start the conversation with all of you. Uh, we put uh, some ideas here, you know, what, uh, are important uh, to tap in uh, from the organizations and leaders. How can uh, they support their teams to feel secured and uh, do the individual risk assessment? So whoever, and Robert, I now uh, count on you, whoever wants to um, share uh, based on this, I would then. Yeah, thank you, uh, thank you so much, Rika. What I would like to now invite everybody to do I think at the bottom of your screen, if your screen is similar to mine, you see something that says participants. If you click on it, you can raise your hand and then I will look for raised hands to, uh, to uh, talk with. I would like to say a little bit about uh, Rika's comment there that <clears throat> unless we have well-being, we really can't be productive. And what we're going to talk about here now is, well, what are organizations doing now? And what should we do? That's the biggest thing. How can we prepare a workplace of the future to deal with crisis? What I want to say is that the um, <clears throat> uh, Nancy Vitale, who's uh, in the well-being space, she was saying it's very true that in response to this coronavirus crisis, people have a wide range of reactions of their tolerance for risk. Some people are like, ah, oh, don't worry, no problem. You know, they would have come to our lovely conference today in Zurich and not worried. Other people are terrified from the first moment. And what's so important about how organizations need to respond to this is to recognize that they need to give individuals the right to choose their tolerance of risk. The organization can't decide for them. That's one example of what's going on in organizations as they try to respond to the coronavirus, as they're trying to say, okay, here's some general guidelines, please work from home, don't come into work if you're sick, things like that. But they're also allowing people to decide their tolerance for risk and uh, otherwise they can't be productive if they're terrified, uh, for example. Okay, so I see Jane Piper has her hand up. Jane, would you like to uh, give us some ideas? Um, interesting talking to some of the organizations that I work with um, and their responses there. 
and uh, two points. One is people are saying they are not implementing or these companies are not implementing plans where they will avoid the risk, but they hope to slow down the spread of the virus mm -hmm. so that the healthcare system can keep up. And I think that is awareness that hasn't been spread widely in organizations, perhaps because they want to keep people calm because they think that taking these measures will eliminate the risk, but actually it's more like uh, spreading the risk, hopefully in the Northern hemisphere to the summertime when the virus will be less contagious. So that was sort of one point there. And uh, secondly, as you say, it was a bit between Laos and what you were saying, Robert, between different people having different levels of tolerance of risk. Some people are hoarding, um, you know, keeping a distance and all these things. Other people are just happy to go on with life as is. And it does seem to me that organizations need to somehow um, create a, a standard there for some people who are more risk taking because they would um, think about themselves like the people in Italy who just then said, okay, the, I'll, um, you know, I'm going to travel anyway before the, um, when they, the news was leaked and they could travel and things like that. So um, that's where, um, you know, there we get this um, conundrum between thinking about people's well-being, as you say, people the, adhering to their level of tolerance, but also the organisation has to uh, some standards at a uh, middle level for people who would be more blasé. Yeah, yeah, no, it's true. It, it is very helpful that the organisation does, in fact, talk to its people. I had one person telling me, you know, uh, she's, she's somebody who travels all the time. She, she works for a pharmaceutical company. She's in sales. She's traveling around the world all the time. And she was saying that when the coronavirus broke out, the CEO wrote, a, wrote an email to everybody saying, okay, we're paying attention. And then uh, didn't write for two weeks. So she didn't know what to do. Should she cancel her trips, start her trips? So it's very important that organizations communicate honestly. Okay, we'll go on. If you want to raise your hand, I will call on you, or I'm also going to give myself permission to call on people. So I would like to call on Muriel. Muriel Bukaz, could you speak with us? Tell us what you think we should be doing. Yes. Hi, Robert. Hi, everyone. Um, I think also the communication part is, is one of the most important parts. I could tell with my friends as well, some of the organization communicated fast. And we're also clear in their guidelines, what is allowed, what is not allowed. They send people home and said like, please stay home, do some home, do some uh, home office. Um, for example, my organization didn't do anything in the first week. And it was weird because everybody took measurements around and you were like, okay, what is happening? I'm also doing mostly workshops on client sites. Um, also I've heard of companies that didn't allow to go anymore to clients if they didn't have the same measurements taken. So they didn't want to put their own um, employees at any risk. So I think it's most important to be clear on the guidelines, whatever guidelines you take, but at least to be clear that you know how to follow. And also I had another call last week about the coronavirus, where it was about the legal perspective for companies. And from a legal perspective, they have to take some measurements or make a statement about it. Otherwise, they also um, have a legally actually a problem if they're not taking any measurements. Yeah, that's uh, thank you for that. That's really helpful also to know. I find that right at the moment, it's very helpful for people to hear practical issues and decisions that uh, organizations are taking and also that people are taking. Uh, when, I think when one is uh, under a lot of stress, it helps to have a very particular and practical response. So uh, thank you for that. Okay, we have a number of uh, hands up. So I would like to call on Sri Devi Shalv. Am I saying your name correctly, uh, Sri Devi? Please come off mute. Okay, we'll wait. Oh, Can you hear me? Yes, now we Hi. hear you. Hi. 
Thank you, Robert, for calling on me. Um, thank you to meet everyone as well. Um, so uh, coming from an organization working internally, obviously, uh, the first step is on the communication. And I think um, as an organization, we've done a good job. But it required tremendous amount of coordination. And I applaud all of my HR colleagues working with our business leaders to be able to drive that um, uh, communication and collaboration. It was not easy. And then we realized as an organization how underprepared we were to take on something like that. So I think um, from that point of view, uh, it's continuous work in progress with several different people and a travel global travel update that's being sent out every two days, informing people what is happening and what is not happening, what are some real practices to follow. And, and obviously, someone mentioned in the bubble earlier, uh, having the right facts. And so the facts is really about making sure that we're sending people to the right websites and not something, anything floating around the internet. It's like World Health Organization, the CDC. So that was very critical as well. And we continue to update our people on a regular basis within the internal challenge, uh, channels and then having a right spark as a, a person in response in each of the different sites uh, being responsible. So that's led by the business themselves so that there is no um, misinformation being spread out. And so not just HR being the center point. So those are sort of like key things that we are taking to do. But I think one of the person on the right side mentioned something about change. And um, the, the virus or anything of such huge proportions really impacts people in how they deal with change, right? So it's just a personal change. It's just organizational change. It's environment change. And so in the absence of right information or even with the right kind of information, there is a level of psychological impact that people have. And so that has to do with how personally people adapt to changes that are coming through. And that will always supersede any other information that's floating out there, even if somebody really important were to come and tell you that this is fine, everything's okay. But how people deal with change is something that's always going to be there. And I think that that's important to address as part of what we're talking about um, and that plays a huge role in how people deal with change. Thank you so so much for those are great thoughts and I, I like something you said in there which was that the we can't leave it up to just HR to do all this now we need everybody involved including the leaders of the organization and the and the employees themselves to be saying here's how I'm de dealing with it so thank you for that information I'm going to call in another hand up here Chris Debner. Chris, you have your hand up. Yeah, hi. Um, hi. I, just, I just want to share one thing where, that I came to know. I do run a network of the heads of mobility, of talent mobility, of the Swiss market index, so the largest Swiss companies. And uh, we also do benchmarking. And I can tell you that the largest Swiss companies, the Nestlés, the Novartis, the Roche, the ABBs, the, you know them, um, they have benchmarked already like three rounds now of the measures that they take towards travel, towards uh, other aspects, towards evacuation, home office, and so on. And, and that benchmarking happens in my inbox. So I can assure you that they all are very active in getting information, in aligning themselves. And uh, some measures are more strict, others are less strict. I mean, some have even gone so far to have a total travel ban, you know, oh, yeah. travel ban, whereas others have just limitations. There yeah. is one member of the SMI, I can't name them. Uh, they have actually, they're involved in the supply chain of medical, uh, medical support in China. So they have really a problem in getting their people out of there because that would be yeah. counterproductive. No, I, I agree with you. I think uh, benchmarking is helpful because uh, almost immediately, especially from an organization standpoint, we want to know what are other organizations doing. So that, that kind of benchmarking is very helpful. Thank you for that quote. I'm going to go on to our other hands, hands up. One, one little aspect that I came to, uh, that came to me is communication is so key because the media is so overwhelming and uh, so scandalous driven sometimes. Right. That if you as an organization can play like a curator for the information and give like sensible, regular information, that manages to keep people more calm, I believe. Th th thank you for your comment. I'm going to move on because we have some other hands up here. Thank you for uh, what you told us. Uh, Manuela Dinardo. Manuela, are you able to come off mute for us? Yes. yes. 
thank you. Sure. I go a step back. I hear um, that HR is involved and what is the role of HR and that it's important. I have heard from companies, they do, don't, they don't, do not even involve HR. And this is something that scares me a little bit. So I would like, was I, I wondering, is it really the case that the CEO or the executive board really does HR involve? And it shows to me that um, even in crisis, it could be that HR does not have this standing. And when we are talking about shake up the future work, for me, it's so important that we in HR have to stand up and really have to make sure that we are on their agenda. So uh, this is something for me that, that uh, showed me and that also scares me a little bit and I'm, I'm a little bit worried about it. So yeah. I was wondering how you... Uh, recognize this what are your experience within the network yes I, I would say very clearly that one of the ways we need to prepare for the future workplace to shape one of the ways we need to shake it up is hr has to be at the c-suite table period because hr has a primary responsibility for the health and well-being of the employees and if they're not at the table that's a serious problem now I would say, uh, I'll say just a, speaking from my own experience, which is, uh, I've been in the uh, field of learning and development for 30, 40 years now, that uh, HR sometimes is a little weak. A HR has to belly up, <laughs> belly up to the table and say, hey, uh, we're important and you need to pay attention to us because especially in this changing digital workplace, uh, you're not going to succeed if our employees are not willing to be on board with you. And so, it, it, but HR has some responsibility to also say, hey, here I am, I'm part of the business, and also to be uh, business oriented, not, not just to be, uh, you know, only a representative of the people to the business, also to listen to the business, the business needs, and then enable the employees to be uh, aligned with it. So, Thank you for that point. It's a great point that HR uh, has some work to do for this future. Okay, yeah. we're getting, we're, we have about five minutes left. Uh, I don't see another hand up, so I'm gonna call on people. I'm gonna call on Siv S Sylvia Jesner. Am I saying your name properly, Sylvia? Uh, please unmute. Yes. Oh, <laughs> yes, although I did not raise my hand. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So, um, yeah, so I think it's a very challenging thing for everyone. So currently I'm um, at home with my husband <laughs> because he's um, in home office too. So uh, I think it can be really challenging to families as well to adopt to this situation and, uh, you know, to create another life um, at home and uh, to to ensure or the requirements to um, uh, to uh, be able to work from home at all, and I think it's also an important uh, thing, and um, and uh, you know to uh, have all the the organizational um, uh, stuff and flow between uh, uh, the colleagues, which is I think not uh, essential uh, at that time. Uh, I mean, being home office at uh, so high level, so like everyone. I would say one of the single biggest uh, shakeups that have happened with this coronavirus for organizations is those organizations not yet prepared to work from for their people to work from home, not to have a they're they're in trouble, they're in real trouble, and they're desperately trying to figure out how their people can work from home. So one of our preparations for the future needs to be that we have an alternative system for people to work from home. And as you say, uh, Sylvia, uh, it's different working from home. You know, you got the kids running around. <laughs> Maybe uh, your uh, partner at home has different views about what should happen. So thank you for that. That's really good. Okay, I have another hand up. Uh, I think this might be the last comment from Philippa Dengler. Philippa. Okay, just to, just to quickly build on that really, what I've seen with some of my client organizations is they've been doing teleconferencing for years and they've been sitting around the table at headquarters with like 10, 15 people in a meeting and dialing in, people dialing in from the regions. And now because they're not getting together in headquarters and they're not traveling, they're actually being forced 
to use technology properly. Like we are here with Mentimeter and with video calls and everybody dining in and not an elite few sitting around a table and the others having to kind of get a word in edgeways. And um, I actually very excited about that because the technology is there. These companies have things like Microsoft Teams, which they're not using properly. Um, and now is the chance for them to actually figure out how cool it is and how they can also create a global community online within their companies using tools they already have. And they're now being forced to do that, which I think is a, is a good thing. I agree. And that is, uh, that is a reality that has occurred at the moment that um, uh, we have to know technology. We have to be able to use it. We have to have technological systems ready at hand uh, to deal with these crises. So uh, thank you. Thank you for that comment. That's a big part of it. And I want to see if I have it. Oh, yeah, I have a hand up from Danielle Stoller Shai. Danielle? Yes. Hello, uh, Robert. Maybe to add uh, just uh, another idea, I have um, I collaborate with uh, with a large manufacturer and they intended to go to a, to a big exhibition in May. And now this exhibition is canceled and they turned that into an opportunity and now create the first virtual exhibition in their in their industry. Wow. And all of a sudden they are not in a panic mode again, but in a, in a back to the driver's seat. And that creates a lot of energy and a lot of uh, um, good thinking and, and positive um, reactions. And uh, that also could be a possibility how to react to such a crisis. Yeah, thank you. That's uh, well said. And of course, uh, we're proud as the uh, Shake Up the Workplace team that we were able to respond uh, in an agile way and to decide, oh, well, I guess we better cancel this lovely conference and do it again in the future. I, I really respect the team for having decided that health and well being. Uh, we're more important in a sense. And uh, I think we're gonna build a strong community. So I want to go back to Rika. Uh, Rika, we have about two minutes left by my watch and uh, anything you would like to say in any final slides there? Uh, yes, uh, yeah, I, I missed this slide, although I love the picture. that <laughs> so, you have already done that, raise your hand. Um, I know that some of you already left because we are a bit over running of the time. So for the ones who have to leave now, please, uh, you can send us your thoughts um, via email or, or in any channel. Uh, you know our availabilities. And for the ones who can stay, then I would like to invite you for a two minutes uh, mindful note taking where we can uh, you know, just uh, write down our um, actions what uh, what we got inspired uh, by this call during the call so to get ready for this i would like everyone to um, invite everyone to close their eyes uh, for uh, a couple of seconds like please sit uh, with straight spine if possible and then just uh, breathe through your nose inhale through the nose and exhale through the nose. Just follow your flow of your natural breath. Really try to focus on only on the breathing and my voice uh, guiding you. You might have heard some noises from the streets or already the thoughts coming to your mind. Just keep your focus for one more moment on your breath. And now virtually in your mind, take a virtual note for yourself. What you will do now, maybe differently after this call or what is that single one learning that you take away after this call today and when you have this then take a very deep breath through the nose again 
exhale and before you open your eyes um, put a smile on your face <laughs> so thank you you can still send us uh, anything that you would like uh, as a feedback and um, we will be in touch with you with the next steps as well Erika, I understand that you will send this or provide a link to this recording for everybody that was on, right? Yes. You plan to share it uh, publicly, correct? And also that you will be doing other um, online virtual sessions like this in the meantime till we have our face-to-face, -face, right? Yeah, that's the plan. Thanks for mentioning, Robert. Uh, we have, uh, if you are not signed up yet uh, to this, uh, uh, to our newsletter, then please do so. You can go on our website and through our newsletter, we communicate uh, uh, everything, including further webinars until the new date. The new date, I can only say it's going to be probably in the autumn, between September, October, November. We had to update uh, based on some administration, uh, uh, like uh, her burdens, uh, uh, our Eventbrite website with the new date, but it's still not the one, the final one. We are uh, working on it now. Thanks, everyone, for joining. And uh, yeah. What a great community. What a wonderful community. Thank, you, Thank you so much for making this possible. Amen. Let's shake up the workplace. Yeah. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you everyone. Thank you. Bye, bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Have a wonderful day. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.